Hello again, welcome to the Institute of Divine Metaphysical Research. This is a school, my name is Peggy Trevison. This is a school, not a church, neither are we affiliated with any religious organizations. This school is a nonprofit, non denominational religious and scientific research organization that is dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. We were incorporated in the state of California in 1958, and since that time, we have established branch schools across the United States, Canada, and other foreign countries. The Syracuse branch was established in 1969. At this time, I'd like to recognize the presence of the Dean of Syracuse Branch, Dr. Patrick Trevison, and our Vice President, Dr. John Cometti. Now, in this school and throughout the lecture this evening, we'll be using the true, correct, and original name and title of the Father, the Word of Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. True name of our Heavenly Father is Yahweh. This has been improperly substituted in most Bibles with the title, Lord. For the word or son, we use the divine title Elohim. This has been improperly substituted with the title God. And the name of the Holy Spirit manifesting in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. This has been erroneously substituted with Jesus Christ. Now, Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. And we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title, which means that Elohim is the title that your Creator chose for Himself. Jesus is a name, but it's an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part into Encyclopedia or Dictionary would prove that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, or the Latin language contain any character or letter in their alphabet that would produce a sound that is made by the letter J. And neither was there a J in the English language until some 1400 years after the death of the Messiah. Therefore, making such names as Jesus and Jehovah impossible in untrue renderings of the true name of the Father and His Son. Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Now, Yahweh, our Heavenly Father, is pure spirit. And in His pure spirit state, He is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in His pure spirit state symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because the cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. And if you take a look at this chart, you'll see that we do have the cloud painted all the way around the edges of the chart so that everything on the chart abides within the cloud in like manner. Everything in the universe abides within this pure spirit state of Yahweh. And Yahweh, knowing that man cannot perceive of him in this pure spirit state, takes on shape and takes on form right within himself as Yahweh Elohim. This is the Word or Son, a superincorporeal being. That is, having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This visionary shape and form can only be seen by divine vision and only understood by divine revelation. Later on, the self-same spirit manifests himself in a physical body, walked the earth, finding as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world has come to know erroneously as Jesus Christ. Now there is only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question we should ask ourselves is what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plane? You can get a better understanding of this name and title by reading a preface to a Holy Name Bible. Now also in this school we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. We call it divine pattern because this is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt and into the wilderness of Sinai, he then called Moses on top of Mount Sinai and revealed this tabernacle pattern to him in a vision. Moses was instructed to return to the wilderness of Sinai and build one exactly as he had seen in the mount. Now this tabernacle pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court round about. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. And in the school we show proof how that everything is made and operates according to the structure and the function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. Now in this school we have ten primary constitutional aims or objectives and they are as follows. First is to help you find and know Yahweh our Elohim as He really is and actually exists. 
Second is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth, to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures compared to religions, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. Fifth, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua Messiah. Tenth, is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the newer state. Now watch for this piece and our slogan is speak the truth. I'd like to have this evening's meeting dedicated with a prayer um, by Dr. Dan Shepard. That will be followed by a scripture reading, which is 2 Timothy, the 4th chapter, verses 1 through 8. Our scripture readers this evening will be Dr. Deb Kmetty and Dr. Scott Miller. And I'll be doing hospitality announcements. Let's all bow our hearts and minds. See, Yashua, thank you. Let's all say. Scripture reading tonight is 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 8. I'll be reading from a Schofield Reference Bible, inserting the true and correct names. 2 Timothy 4 and 1. I charge thee therefore before Elohim and the Savior, Yahshua the Messiah, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be diligent in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which Yahshua, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that have, unto all them also that love his appearing. That's Second Timothy 4, verses 1 through 8. I want to welcome everyone that's here with us this evening and also our viewers in YouTube land. Appreciate everyone tuning in and being here. And uh, for our first speaker, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Juan Burton. I, I think I should listen to the... Okay, he wants to sit out. Okay. Our next speaker, then our speaker will be Dr. Scott Miller. Um, we've been working with this for a couple Wednesdays. I thought I worked with it, but I looked back and I had not. <laughs> so, 
Um, so it's talking about sort of like towards the end, what's going to happen at the end. Because this was written at the beginning of the age. And they could already see that people were departing from the faith at the beginning of the age, you know, because, you know, once Yahshua took off the flesh and, you know, he had a core group of people, you know, and over time, things just, you know, the mystery of iniquity waxed greater towards, you know, as things went on. And then uh, towards the end, he gets power too. And you're seeing that manifested now how the end is declared from the beginning. Um, so uh, why don't we read in the scripture there? You can just start there. Second Timothy 4 and 1. I charge thee therefore before Elohim and our Savior, Yahshua the mm -hmm. Messiah, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Right. So that's a lot right there. Who shall judge... So that's like future tense, because they're still in the flesh. You know, and you need, they're talking about, you know, who shall judge, which is a future. You know, the quick, or those who are quickened, or that means made alive. The quick is short for quickened. And that means those who have received the Holy Spirit in the faith. But he's really judging everybody. That's the thing. That's one of the mysteries you've come to find out that... Really, we're, we be, we're in the judgment because he's aware he's in all of us. Um, and he knows what everyone's thoughts are and he knows what everyone's going to do. So he's aware of what mysteries within you, influencing you, because he's in charge of that stuff. He's the one who put them there. <laughs> so go ahead. Preach the word, be diligent in season, out of season, reprove. Rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Right. So use doctrine. Use you have the Bibles. You know. Um, what's the aim with the earnestly contend? Can we read that? I forget um, what aim. This is the eighth aim: to earnestly contend for the common salvation right. and faith, which was once delivered to the sons or children of mm -hmm. Yahweh. Right. To earnestly contend. Now, to contend is like, you know, it comes from the word contentious, or there's going to be some contentiousness or some debate, you know. There was in the beginning. They didn't see how this, they didn't see, they didn't give up that law, you know, easily. And people now don't, they don't want to give up the law, even though it was never given to them. Um, so... That's just what we're facing in the world. You know, people don't want to give up what they grew up with or what they're used to or what's been ingrained in them. They hold on to these traditions and stuff. And, uh, you know, and they hold fast to them. And that's, unfortunately, people get sealed in these delusions, you know, but that's, that's how it was supposed to, you know, you come to find out that these things were set up way back in the cloud. So, you know, just, so no matter how good you preach it, you know, if you weren't meant to see it, you're not going to see it, but go ahead. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. Right. Now, you had different, different divisions and groups. You had the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, or the Sadducees, <laughs> you know, and some of them didn't, they didn't believe in the resurrection, they didn't believe what was being taught. They didn't believe what was, you know, they didn't believe in the gospel. Um, and, you know, of course, people today aren't going to believe in the gospel. But you have what's going on in the beginning of this age going to happen at the end. Um, why don't we get the end declared from the beginning? So we can get some foundation, some law and prophets, and get some water here. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Okay. Remember the former things of old. For I am Elohim, and there is none else. I am Elohim, mm -hmm. and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from right. ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, right. and I will do all my pleasure. See, his counsel shall stand, and he'll do all his pleasure. He's going to declare the end of things from the beginning. And we know he brought it in in fire, and he's going to take it out in fire. 
And it's talking about how towards the end, it, you know, he's going to judge the quick and the dead at his appearing. Um, which we know is right down here. We're close to that. Um, revelation of Yahshua the Messiah, end of mortality in present age. Um, So, you have to be translated into the kingdom. And you can't do that by works. We know that. And Yahshua has to make intercession for us. And you are baptized with the Holy Spirit. And that is done on the inside. See, all these things that were done on the outside, over here on this side of the cross, are really still being carried over but in a spiritual sense and that's what is so confusing to so many people that they don't understand that these things are internal things that were never given to the to the gentiles are going to be internal things spiritually so for jew and gentile alike um romans in the second chapter two where it says where it talks about the Gentiles who have not the law. Is it Romans 2, 28 maybe? Romans 2, 20. Romans 2 and, let's see, 12. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before Elohim, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Mm. For when the Gentiles, who have not the law, right. do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves. Right, so when the Gentiles, which have not the law, and Paul's saying they don't have the law, it was never given to us. And Doc used to say all the time that if you can show me in the Bible where the law applied to the Gentiles, he would like eat the buck. He would make that claim. And I don't ever remember hearing him eating the Bible. You know, because he didn't have to, he knew that wasn't in, he knew what was in the book. So when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. Go ahead, 15. Who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile, accusing or right. else excusing one another. Right, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. And that's the Gentiles being picked up. It's not just the Jews. We know that, that initially it was all about the Jews, and then seven years later, see in seven years in Acts the 10th chapter, you have the Gentiles being grafted in. So, go ahead. Read that again, in, 50. Who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. Mm -hmm. So they're, day, Right, so it's in their conscience. It's written in their hearts, and it's manifested in their conscience, also bearing witness, and their thoughts. So all these things are being, because it says somewhere, like bringing every thought into captivity. See, Yahshua, he's aware of good and bad. He's all our thoughts. Yahweh knows all, every thought. And see, when you have the Holy Spirit, he's going to bring every thought into captivity. So you're thinking right about the thing. It's not that you're working up on it or choosing to do anything. That's just not how it works. Yahshua has to, you know, I'm not saying you can't study and learn stuff. You know, that's why we come to class. You know, remember the work of Elohim is to believe. And how he gets you to believe is he laid down witnesses. The law and the that's why the law and the prophets are so important, so important, and that's why they're depicted as keys because key, you know they're they are key key things. If something's key, if you say something's key, that's like a, a, a word for that. Yeah, it's like oh that's key. That's important. Something key is very important, and see that's why they're laid down as keys. And there's also like a male and a a male and a female too like Elohim was male there's like a little little symbols here like a male and then a female because they go together you know just like the Jew and the Gentile go together as one the head and the body go together Yahshua and the bride go together Elohim means plural means male and female and see and the law reflects that and that's why there's two little things there 
I don't know when I noticed that, but it was some time ago. I've been thinking about that, how there's a male and a female symbol on them. I don't know if they're really small. I don't know if you could see them, but <laughs> anyway. So these things are all, you know, we're broken down. And now he's, he's through time, is, is working the Jew and the Gentile, fulfilling the law and bringing it all together down through the dispensation and ages. And he did it from he declaring the end from the beginning. And there's going to be a time shortly where it talked about in the scripture where he's going to judge the quick and the dead. And that's coming up. And that's why things are, you know, most people never even heard the term tsunami. And there's been like three of them with, in the last like 10 years that's killed like hundreds of thousands. One killed like a couple hundred thousand people. A natural disaster in our life, it almost seems like, you know, they use the term, it's biblical, you know, in nature. But it really, <laughs> these things are. You know, all the fires in California, they're saying that, you know, California used to have like a, a fire season. And we know the most holy place, you know, being in gold out in California, where the gold is on fire, you know, it's going to go out in fire. And it's man manifested in the most holy place out there. They're saying the fire season is essentially year round now. Yes. Where it used to be, yeah. I just saw someone give that testimony in Oceanside where... Because you can hear from you don't always hear that. There's so much stuff in the news now. You don't hear other little things. You know we're being consumed by the Supreme Court nominee that's going on and all the contentiousness and the the really comes down to the truth and the lie. You know, and there's been a lot of lies out there just like now. But Yahshua's keeping us. He's keeping us in the ark. Thankfully, you know we're you know there's just small pockets of the truth through the country. And we have to hold fast because, you know, people are going to, you know, depart from the faith. They're going to give heed to seducing spirits. And that's like in, uh, like, Timothy, 1 Timothy. But, um, what, we, what were we reading? Uh, I got off on a tangent. Uh, the last, uh, this <laughs> in 2. In the day when Elohim shall judge the secrets of mm -hmm. men by Yahshua the Messiah according to my gospel. Right, in the day, that's, there's that day again when Yahweh shall judge the secrets of men. Which really, we're in the day of Yahweh, so that's a mystery. Because he knows all our secrets. So really at that then when he's judging, it's just going to manifest. What, what is within you is going to manifest. And, and it says we shall be... We read that not too long ago where it says that we, we shall be like him. When he yeah, when he appears. Where is that? Is it in Corinthians? Is that racist? I know it says we be, should be changed. Well, why don't you... That sounds more like it might be. Yeah, I didn't think of Corinthians talks. Let's, let's stay and let's work with Corinthians in the fifth because it talks about manifesting at that end time what, what it's going to be like, how quick it's going to be. What's the verse, Dan? First John, is that what you said? First John 3 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called. Children of Elohim, therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Loving right. how are we, the children of Elohim, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but right. we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Right, there's that shall be again, just like in the scripture, that he shall, see, because that's coming up. And they knew that in the beginning of the age, that, that people were going to depart from the faith and, you know, keep to themselves teachers with itching ears and you see that kind of thing going on. Now there was the big, big separation over doctrine. And really I pretty much thought that was going to be it. But you can see how there's more stuff going on even within, you know, what we call our camp, so to speak, doctrinally about predestination. People are having a lot of hard time with predestination and choice and stuff. And I'm telling you, I'm not liking what I'm hearing in some of the classes. It's People aren't even using the word predestination, and they're going with choice, and choice, you might as well say free will, you know? They're leaning more towards a free will way of looking at things, and it's just not how 
Yahweh has it laid up where he has everything under control. That's right. <clears throat> so go ahead, Dan. Can you just pick up that last verse where it says, We shall be appearing? Beloved, now are we the children of Elohim, mm -hmm. and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. What we shall be. know that when he shall appear, Fair. we shall be like him. We shall be like him, right. Because we're going to get. We shall see him as he is. And we shall see him as he is, right. Because he's super incorporeal, which, you know, I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> it just says we shall be like him. We're going to get, and, it, and then Corinthians, it talks about, um, first how Yahshua was the first fruits. Why don't you read in 15, I guess, 15, it's a long chapter. You can get bogged down in it. Uh, 15 and 20. Start there. Corinthians 15, 20. But now is the Messiah risen from the dead and become right. the first fruits of them that slept. Right, so now, anytime usually it says now, it's after Pentecost. Now. In this age, present kingdom age. But remember, the end is declared from the beginning, so now, read. For since, yeah. for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Right. For as in Adam all die, even so in the Messiah shall all be made alive. So since by man, which is talking about Adam, came death, for by man came also the resurrection, which is Joshua, and it talks about that later. For as in Adam all died, so in Yahshua shall all be made alive. So it's just lining up Adam and Yahshua. And we've done that many times where Adam died... Where, um, where does it say that? Where he was Adam not being deceived? Is that in like Peter? Second Timothy. Timothy. I got it. Where it talks to Yahshua, you can't, Yahshua was never deceived. Right. You know? Yahshua died willingly for his bride. Right. And, and see, it's, uh, and Eve is, is the offspring from Adam and she's his bride. And, and again, we are Yahshua's offspring and we are his bride. And so you can go right back to Adam and learn things about how Yahweh set that up, declaring the end from the beginning. So you're right back here in the garden, we can find out stuff about his purpose and how that stuff works. Do you have that? First Timothy 2 and 13. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the right. woman was in the transgression. Right. Adam, see, not being, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. She was deceived and she disobeyed. See, and Adam died willingly as a type to show that he was a type of Yahshua. So, and then Paul's picking up the same thing in Corinthians over here that it was right back from the beginning and he understands how, because he had the same vision as Dr. Kinley, as Moses, as John, all they all had this understanding so that's really why the book's written in one author, and it has really, and you can say the end is declared from the beginning. And someone called it, it might have been Peg, looking unto Yahshua, the author and the finisher of our faith. So he told Moses what to write. He's right here behind the scenes here, authoring things, telling him what to write. Because the things Moses wrote about, he wouldn't have any idea. He wasn't there. He wasn't there at his birth. How does Moses know he was drawn out of a basket with pitch? that was pitched like the ark, or any of the little details that, you know, Moses wrote about in such vivid, because he saw these things in a vision, and it was seared in his memory, and he was told what to write. Um, do we have any more? What do we have holding out there? Uh, 15. Not 15? No. she shall be saved in childbirth. childbirth. If they continue in faith yes. and love and holiness with sobriety. Right. Okay, um... Go back to First Corinthians. First Corinthians fifteen and twenty-three. Now remember, in twenty it said how Yahshua now he's the first fruits of them who had risen, which means that's going back. So remember, he said in the scripture he'll judge the quick and the dead. So in the first fruits, they're not leaving this age. Just how this candlestick was filled in the middle. And it filled, was filled with oil, and it went back. It went filled both the front and the back, just how Yahshua comes in in the fourth age and see and fulfills 
the old covenant back here, and then ushers in the new covenant and covers all the, all the dispensations and ages and fulfills the, the old, but he's all, not leaving anyone behind because they're part of, the, even though they didn't have the Holy Spirit on a permanent basis, they weren't left out of the mix. They were, you know, they were part of the purpose too. You know, and he says he's the first fruits of them that slept. So, and that's, you know, the quickened and the dead, those who were dead, um, that was in our scripture. Go ahead in Corinthians. But every man in his own order, the Messiah, the first fruits afterward, they that are the Messiahs at his coming. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to Elohim, right. even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority right. and then power. Then cometh the end. Yeah, this is like... All right, so then cometh the end, and we have 1 Corinthians 15.53 on here too, which we're getting, that's, that's up, coming up. So keep going. Then cometh the end. It's talking about the end. Read. 25. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest right. that he is accepted who did put all things under and, him. And that's cool because it's showing that Yahshua is the creator. And it's saying, you know, he's not just a man. A man's not put under him as a physical man would be. But he's the creator and he's accepted from that because he's the one putting all things under his feet. So don't get confused if it's, think it's referring to Yah, but Yahshua's doing all that work. See? And he's going to wrap it up here at the end and he's gathering together and we're going to go on in ages. I mean this isn't the end of the purpose. The ending is way over, it says ending here. See we're just, we're just getting started. I used to think that like when you, when you died like you know you just went to heaven and whatever thing you like to do whether it was golf or you know I always say I never played golf so I thought I'd be bored in heaven. I didn't you know everyone's playing golf on their favorite golf course and you know, and then that was it. You just golfed or something, and then you didn't do anything else. You know, which may sound good to some people, yeah. may not, but you know, again, we made having what we wanted to be, and not really what it's about. And I always think of, um, I don't know if, again, I apologize, I'm not good at knowing where stuff is, but where they ask Yahshua about a woman who was in adultery, mm -hmm. and they ask who her husband is in the afterlife. Which really isn't a bad question. You know, technically, because they're trying to trip him up because, you know, you know, but they didn't, they didn't have an answer. And most people, you know, so who's, who's your, she had a couple husbands, or maybe it wasn't even like adultery. Maybe it was just like he, he died and she remarried. I can't remember the specific. Well, she kept dying and she kept yeah, she got married. Yeah, yeah. So they're wondering, like, okay, so who's her husband then? Is her husband's died, and then she married a couple other ones, and and then Yahshua has an answer. For, but the big mystery now, see, Yahshua's judge. See, you have to have the Holy Spirit now in in the in the flesh. And without it, you're being, you're, you're being judged either way, you know. And then in that day, it, it's going to be revealed who's in the bride. And, and it talks about until he hath put all things under his feet. But it's, it, the things he's putting under his feet are Satan and, and, and his demons and all the souls that were going to go to the second death. Did you want that? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> or if you, Matthew. Right, and I bet you they're one of the, they didn't even believe in the resurrection, so go ahead. 24, saying, Master Moses said, If a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife, and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, died. And having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, out second also, and the third, and unto the seventh. And last of the last of all, the woman died also. 
28, therefore in the resurrections, whose wife shall she be mm -hmm. of the seven? For they all had it. Mm -hmm. 29, Asher answered and said unto them, you do err, not knowing the scripture, nor the power of Noah. Right, he's telling them you do err. You're not looking at the thing right. You're looking at a manifestation that she's going to be with the different, you're going to have husbands and your life, you're looking at it from the physical. Go ahead. 30. Uh, 29. That's my answer to the of them. You do err, not knowing the scripture, nor the power of Noah. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, mm -hmm. nor are like the angels of Elohim in heaven. Right. You neither marry or given in marry, or you're like the angels, which... And is that all it says there? Uh, 31. And, but as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by Elohim, saying, I am the Elohim of Abraham, and the Elohim of Isaac, Elohim of Jacob. Elohim, Elohim is not the Elohim of the dead, but of the living. Of the living. See, there's the quick, the quickening, and the dead. See, the quicken is those of He's the Elohim of the living, or those that have been made alive. Or he's the head, and the bride is the body. See, and he's building that. And that Yahshua is your husband, and the afterlife really is the answer. That's, it's not these physical, you don't have, you know, different men or different woman, you know, he said, you're not look, you're looking at it from a physical standpoint. From a spiritual standpoint, Yahshua is our bride. Yahshua is our husband. We're the bride. Right. <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just got off at 4.30 or five, around 5 <laughs> on my schedule. But anyway, so, you know, we're the bride. Yahshua is the husband. And see, that's who, you know, and it's not about a physical... You're not male or female, and it says that too in the book. Paul explains how you're not male nor female, nor bond nor free, but we are one in Yahshua. I don't know if anyone knows where that is, because that's a good scripture. What is it? We want to hold in 1 Corinthians. We're still working there. Galatians 3 and 26. Be all the children of Elohim by mm -hmm. faith in the Messiah Yahshua. For as many as you have been baptized unto the Messiah have been right. born unto the Messiah. Right. There's that baptism, but not of not of water, but of the Spirit. Remember, I mentioned the, on this side of the cross, you're baptized in the name and in the Spirit. Go ahead. Twenty-eight. For there is neither Jew nor Greek, there right. is neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor or female. female. There's neither Jew nor Greek, which is that's what a Jew or Gentile. That's what he broke down the whole world as. You're either Jew or Gentile. And there's neither bond nor free. Bond is like you're bonded or you're in, you're in bondage or you're a slave or you're a free person. Because that's back then they looked at, you know, people were in slavery. People were free. Go ahead. You're neither male nor female, right? 28. Female. Male nor female. There's neither male nor female. Mm -hmm. Who knew that? I didn't know. <laughs> didn't you think like, don't you think of like in the afterlife? Did you think you weren't a sex? Did you ever think you weren't going to be male or female? If you were male, did you think you weren't going to be male in the afterlife? Not pretty much everyone. Th who gave you that idea? Where'd that come from? The mystery of iniquity? That's not, in that, you know. See, you were not going to marry and given in marriage and because you're not male or female. See, and he, Paul's looking beyond the flesh in Galatians there. He's looking beyond the flesh and what's, what is on the other side and what's, what we're married to. You know, what we're working, what us and Yahshua, that marriage there, isn't, isn't these things like it is in the physical. It's different. This is so the truth is so much different than you ever conceived, you know. Um, For you are all one in the Messiah. Right. We're all one in Yahshua the Messiah. And that's what it says in like Ephesians. Why don't we get that and hold, hold in Corinthians. That he's going to gather together in one. And again, all these are all, when he's gathered, he's been gathering since the beginning. Ephesians 1 and 9. 
having made known well, unto us the mystery of his will, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. It Just like it said in Isaiah, we read, you know, his purpose, his counsel shall stand. Read. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, mm -hmm. he might gather together in one all right. things in the Messiah. Right, that's another way of saying, what, what are we reading? Colossians? Ephes Colossians? Ephesians? So I'm thinking it's got to be up here because it's talking exactly Ephesians, there's 2, 19 and 22. What is this? Ephesians 1? This is, but it's talking about the end. That's my point. And it's talking about the universal revelation. That's what we're talking about. The, the upcoming universal revelation of Yahshua, where it's what is going to manifest is what's been within us this whole time. Okay. Go ahead, Deb. And in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one right. all things in the Messiah, uh, both which are in heaven right. and which are on earth. Which are on earth. So he's talking about, you know, the things that are in the earth, the physical elements. You know, we talked about how he's going to gather together. He's going to roll them up like a scroll. And when he takes this thing out, it's going to happen quick. And that's where we are in Corinthians, where it's, it happens quick, like in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Dan? Okay, so it's up here, Ephesians two nineteen and twenty nineteen through twenty two. Okay. Then it says three fourteen and fifteen. If you want to get that too. Ephesians two nineteen. Now therefore, ye are no more strangers mm -hmm. and sojourners, but fellow citizens with the sons and of the right. household of Elohim, right. and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Yahshua the Messiah himself being the chief cornerstone. In whom all the building fitly framed together. That's another way of looking how he's, he's building that body. And he does it through the symbolism of building um, the temple, which is really a, a cool, another aspect of building that body or building that he's gathering together. Like every stone was hewed outside of that building and, and made to a specific size and fit right within. That's how every person, we're like at every a different stone that he chips away at on the inside. You can't see it, you know. You, you know, our co-workers, our friends, our family that aren't in class, they, they can't always see everything that we're thinking about and what's been worked on and chipped away at on the inside. You know, but see, that's, that's what will be revealed. People will see that in that day. But, okay, go ahead if there's more there. In whom all the building, fitly framed mm -hmm. together, grows unto a holy temple in Yahshua, right. in whom ye also are built together for a habitation of Elohim through the right. Spirit. And that's why that was up here in Canaan's land, like in the type of, in the promised land, in the type of heaven. It wasn't this temple that was fitly, it was this permanent one symbolizing the new covenant and it had to be built in, up here in Canaan's land. Because it's symbolizing like, you know, that building or that bride and all the different aspects being fit together and gathered and, you know, up to that day here. Go ahead. Uh, and then Ephesians if, 3 and 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah, mm -hmm. of whom the whole family in heaven and yeah, earth is right. named. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory mm -hmm. to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Right. Strengthen that inner man or the soul. Um, let's go back. Is that it? Or is there? Mm -hmm. All right. Let's go to Corinthians. We could run all the scriptures here and the, going into them, but I didn't really want to totally do that. See, I think we were like in 20, 20, you want to pick it up in 24? 24. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the mm -hmm. kingdom to Elohim, even the Father. And then cometh the end, the end of what? You know, here he's talking about the end, the end of the physical creation. We already read it, where yeah, there's going to be a time where Yahshua is going to gather together in one. Mm -hmm. Things in heaven and in earth, and, we're, and move them into the next day. It's not completing everything, like, you know, I thought that when you, when they died, or if there was an end, that that was that it was just the end, you know. And then you were floated around in space, you know. But no, the Yahweh has you know a purpose for us, and we're going to go on in the ages to come, you know, learning about His love and kindness and about His purpose, you know. And that's exciting, you know. That is, you know. 
Um, okay, let's finish this up in Corinthians. He shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. Mm -hmm. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Right. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Right, or Satan. Right, it's because he's in the everlasting chains of darkness. Mm -hmm. See, he's all, you know, his fate is sealed just like everyone else's, really. There's no, he's not making any choices to do anything. He's, he's done. He's toast, you know. And that's just how it was set up. Go ahead. For he hath put all things under his feet. Mm -hmm. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted who did put all things under mm -hmm. him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him. Right. That Elohim may be all in all. Now it's going back in. Now it's going, you know, into the, over into this age. It does that. Because over here you have, see, 1 Corinthians 15, 27 and 28, <laughs> which is, and I said that before, you have 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, 53 here, but some of this is talking about over into this age where it's, he's seeing down through the ages towards how he's gathering together. So just to put that out there, I don't want to get, you know, but you want to keep your ages straight, but there, it's on the, and it's on the chart, you can look at Read this for yourself and look at the scriptures and stuff. But um, keep going. Else what shall they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Mm. Why are they then baptized for the dead? And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? All right. Why don't you jump down to 35? 35. But some man will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not made alive except it die. Remember we were talking about one body and how we said we, <laughs> we shall be like Yahshua? Mm -hmm. However that's going to be, we're going to get an immortal glorified body. Because mm -hmm. we already have an immortal soul. Mm -hmm. And that immortal soul is either going to go on to honor or go on to dishonor. Mm -hmm. It's going to go on in ages learning to come of your heavenly father in love and being the bride you know of, of of our heavenly father or it's going to go on with the mystery of iniquity you know and everlasting chains of darkness and you're sealed in, in that mystery too if that if it goes out and you're sealed in that mystery then that's unfortunately not good you know but that's that's the the harsh reality of of this purpose sometimes but you know, hallelujah, we know that <laughs> we sit and, you know, we're sitting and, and standing for the truth and in the right place here. Um, keep going. And that which Let's thou keep... sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but a bare grain. Mm -hmm. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But Elohim gives it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men another flesh of beasts, another of fish, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. Right, remember we said, it talked about, you know, you're not like a male or a female, but we shall be like incorporeal, like the angels. And that's what I was just saying. We have an, an immortal, you know, soul within us that doesn't, you know, doesn't have flesh. We have a flesh covering and it talks about that in 2 Corinthians, how we have a house, you know, if this fleshly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a house of Elohim within us. But I'll keep going here, and it talks about But the glory of the selling. celestial is one, mm -hmm. and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon. Right. One. Another glory of the stars, for one star differ from another in glory. Right. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. Right. So also is the resurrection of the dead. So it's sown in corruption. Read. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. Right. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. And think about like a seed from a natural standpoint, how that manifests or any death, burial, resurrection. 
or how Yahshua was so, and he, he looked like, you know, it looked like he was, it was dishonored, you know, like it was a losing thing. But see, when he resurrected, he resurrected a quickening spirit, and that was the first fruits of them that slept. See, and then we went on, then he carries on, and he goes in the hearts and minds of men, and there's that baptism of the spirit. See, but he's got to be sown, you know, sown in dishonor and raised in honor. You know, that was, they thought that this, that was it. It was over. You know, they looked at that and said, you know, you know, what happened to him restoring the kingdom and, and restoring Israel and he was the king and he was supposed to do all these, you know, so they didn't get it. <laughs> See, his kingdom wasn't of this earth. It was a spiritual kingdom he was building. His bride was spiritual. It wasn't physical people. He was collecting a, unto himself to rebuild a physical Israel. That's what they thought. And that's what people think to this day. They're waiting for Jesus to come back and restore the kingdom. You know, many religions teach that. And they think that he's going to come back and set up Jerusalem and all that stuff. And, you know, and that's part of being Jerusalem, being, you know, not to get too political, but, you know, we recently made Jerusalem like the capital officially, the United States, you know, we've never ever done that kind of thing before, which was a big, you know, thumb in the eyes of the Palestinians. You know, we're, we're fully siding with Israel when we've always, for peace, you know, had a two-state solution where Jerusalem would have been the co-capital. That was set up in the United Nations partition in like 1948, I think, or 50, like right after they became a nation. And Israel agreed to that, actually. And see, that's never going to be, you know, that's the, but they're looking at physical Israel and Jerusalem and all that kind of physical things as signs to mean something, you know. And I'm not saying, look, it was kind of, you know, not, not that there wasn't any significance of Israel being, but that's not what it's about. See, Israel is, it's about spiritual. All this stuff is spiritual. That's what we've, I've tried to explain from, from the beginning. And, you know, that's the thing that the world can't grasp onto this gospel is that how it's all, the physical is pointing to the spiritual. It's Romans 1, 19 and 20. And that's exactly what he's talking about here, about just a simple witness of like a seed being buried and how it resurrects. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll just finish up here down to like 52 and I'll, I'll get down. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul the last adam was made a life -giving right or quickening spirit and there's lining up the adam again where you can look at the purpose right from the beginning of adam being a type of yashua that first man adam was made a living soul mm -hmm. and the second man adam which is yashua was made a quickening spirit read however that was not first which is spiritual mm -hmm. but that which is natural right and afterward that which is spiritual the see the physical had to be first and then the spiritual Go ahead. The first man is of the earth, earthy. Mm -hmm. The second man is Yahshua from heaven. The second man is Yahshua from heaven. The second man, it's the second, it doesn't say the second man is Yahshua from Mary and Joseph. <laughs> the second man is Yahshua from heaven. Go ahead. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. Mm -hmm. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Right. Now this I say, brother. Now this I say, brother. Now next time the Jehovah's Witnesses are at your door, you tell them this scripture. <laughs> they don't know how to answer it. Go ahead, read. The flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of Elohim. The flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of Elohim. See, if the world did... Who knew that was in the Bible? It's been in our Bibles. That's, it's not a special Bible. That's in everybody's Bible. That's in the Jehovah's Witness Bible. They'll read, if you call scriptures, they'll read them out loud to you. Had them do it. <laughs> you call, tell them about it, you know, because they have a kingdom on earth that's physical. You know, where you're petting lions and all the bad people are gone and they're in somewhere else. And I guess they have hell too. But, you know, but the kingdom is on is a physical kingdom on earth, you know? It's everything opposite of what the scriptures say. Go ahead. 50. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. Right, see, this is a mystery. I show you a mystery, read. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Right. 
In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Right, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. <laughs> what are the chances at the last, that our president would be named Trump? <laughs> the last trump. <laughs> Who knows? Could be telling us something. <laughs> the last Trump right in the right in the book. The moment the twinkling eye we're talking about right here at the end. The last Trump. Is that it? For the trumpet Trump. shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall yeah, be changed. Right, and we shall be changed. And that's it. We we'll shall be changed. And we'll go on in the ages yet to come learning about our Heavenly Father. So with that I'll take my seat. I hope Somebody was edified by that, and all praises the Yashua. Thanks. And our next speaker will be Dr. Frank DeMassey. Good evening, class. Picking on the jailers tonight. That's all right. Anytime you can stand before and testify this beautiful gospel, it's nothing but a blessing. You know, uh, if we ever, my, my main prayer is that I really come to complete 100% acknowledgement of how blessed I am. That I've been able to understand and see the purpose of my creator. I know that sounds like a bold statement. I'm not trying to be. But truth comes with witnesses. Dr. Kinley said, you don't, you don't have any choice of joining or, or choosing your salvation. It's the same as you didn't have any choice of how you came in in your own family. You had no choice. Either you were predestined to see this or to be born into, into Yahshua's body or you're not. Like so many things that this flesh and our backgrounds we try not to bring with us but we do because of our, our backgrounds. Judgment. I would think, I mean, when I was a kid I would think that there's just going to be this long line of, of people waiting in a, in a judge in a, in a with a big hammer and, and either reject or deny and you have to come in, an accountant for what you've done and that's not what the deal is see what this is now in this age see right here this time right here now in that cloud those souls that were predestined, he, was, he chose them and gave them to Yahshua. That in some time in that purpose, those souls were going to be made alive. Those souls were going to be converted. So what's happening now in this day, in this age, is by the foolishness of preaching this gospel, those souls that were predestined are going to come to fruition. And that's what, that's what the judgment is. That's why we're in the judgment now, because you're either going to be in the body, or out of the body. That's where you're one or the other. Now you're in the, you're in the influence of one or the other. There's still a chance. You never know who Yahshua has chosen to hear this gospel. And the beauty of it is you're converted right where you sit. But again now, us being chosen and in, in this gospel, there's things that can create confusion. There's paradoxes. Okay, one of the first paradoxes I, I understood was, uh, we'll get it, uh, John 1.18 and Exodus 24, 9 and 10. Because when I read that, that looked like a paradox to me. I didn't get it. I didn't understand it. I said, well, this Bible's wrong. Which one you I don't care. Either or. Uh, John 1 and 18. No man has seen God at any time. Uh, Exodus 24 and 9. 
Then went up Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. And, and they saw the God of Israel. Okay, so you know, 73 people saw, 74 people saw God. Nobody's seen God. Now before we, any of us walked through that door and sat before this gospel, that was a paradox that we could not contain or understand in our minds. We just thought there was a misprint or something's wrong. But if you take it in context, if you, that's what a paradox, you have to take it in context of, of the meaning and the semantics of how you, you understand and think words are. Well, I didn't understand the meaning of a name or the importance of a name until you came through that door and you sat down. Then all of a sudden, wow, the name's important. I, I kind of, it, it, it made so much sense. It just was frustrating that all them years you would kneel down in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and you didn't know what the heck you're talking about. In the name of what? Our Father. How many Our Fathers did I have to say? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I never caught it. Never, ever caught it. And only by grace, and by walking through, and standing before this gospel, can that understanding be, be distributed to others. That Yahshua opened their soul and their eyes and their ears to it. It's a paradox. Choice. Choice. Okay. Now, that's a, there's another paradox. Because, first of all, they keep using, people use Joshua. Let's get, let's get to that. Let's, let me try and put an end to that one. Choose you this day. See, here's the, the irony when I, or paradox what I'm trying to make you understand is there are choices to, to be made. I'm not saying there's no choices, but the point where you got to understand and realize is that the choice you make is going to be dictated by the mystery that's, that's guiding your soul. Either you're, either there's two mysteries in operation, right? You've got the mystery of righteousness and the mystery of iniquity. You have a choice. But whatever choice you choose is going to dictate by whatever is guiding your soul. You're either going to be choosing to glorify either yourself or some physical need or some fleshly thing, or you're going to be glorifying the Father. It's not that difficult. But you've got to put it in context because there are choices that are going to be made. I'm not saying you don't have a choice. Yeah, sure, but it's predestined. Whatever choice that you choose was predestined in the cloud. He's the author and finisher of our faith. He knows. He's not sitting at the end and wondering, well, geez, I wonder how many I'm going to get. Like when I go fishing. <laughs> I wonder how many I'm going to get. I don't think so. There's nothing he doesn't know. It's all just got to come to manifest. It's not that difficult. Let's not make it so, so hard and, and complex. It's not. It's simple. It's in context. It's semantics. It's what you understand, choice. Well, choice, I thought choice was, well, I have a choice to choose my this or that. Yeah, you do. But when it comes to your salvation, you have no choice. Because it's all been predestined. Whatever you choose was predestined that you did choose. So yeah, you have a choice, but no, you don't have no choice. Because you can't choose your salvation. You're born into it. Either you're born into it or you're not. It's not that hard. Let me try and kill this, this Yahshua one there. I, I doubt I probably won't, but... Choose you this day. Set it up. Because, see, people are, are thinking, well, see, choose you this day. And for my, me and my house, we'll, we'll serve Yahweh. Well, that's not the context of what that's, what's going on there. Because the choice that, they, that Yahshua was telling them is either choose this, this idol or that idol. Because he didn't have the ability because he wasn't in them to choose the right thing. But he's going to. For me and my house, I'll, cho I'll serve my father, surely. So, but yeah, you can look at that and say, well, see, they had a choice. Yeah, but no. They had a choice. But whatever they chose was predestined and, 
and uh, motivated by the, the mystery that's in them. They didn't have it in them. Oh, if they only had a heart in them. Go ahead, Scott. Uh, Joshua 24, I'll pick it up in 13. And I have given you a land through which you did not labor, and cities which ye built not. And ye dwell in them of the vineyards and the olive yards which ye planted, not do you eat. Therefore fear Yahweh and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood. See, that's in Babylon, in, in Egypt, they were, they were serving other gods. He's telling them, choose you this day. Which ones are you going to choose? He knew which ones. He's not going to sit back and wonder, say, geez, I wonder what's, what they're going to choose. Everything's been set up. Everything's predestined. It's not that hard. It's not difficult to understand. It's a paradox. There's paradoxes, the same as, as we understood the name. Well, geez, if, if you substituted the right names, now all of a sudden, yeah, no man has seen the Father at any time because he's pure spirit. You, you understand? Because we put it in context, and now a paradox isn't a paradox because we put it in context of what's going on. You can't choose to be in this body. You, can't, you didn't choose to be in your own family. How can you choose one way or the other? Did, are, we, are we close to that yet, Scott? Or are they? God's which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and served ye Yahweh. And if it seem evil unto you to serve Yahweh, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether, it, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites. Right, so you either had one pagan gods or other pagan gods to choose. But for Yahshua, he knew they couldn't choose to serve Yahweh because it, he wasn't in them. He didn't have the heart in them yet. It was all by his purpose. It's all by his purpose. That's what this is so beautiful about. That's why he had to come in and die. And without his blood, there is no, there is no sacrifice there's no, no, no sacrifice for sin. Now once he, with that blood, and now at Pentecost, it's a beautiful love story. It's something that, that once you start to see it and understand it, it just leaves you breathless. You stand back in, in, in awe and, want, and know what you're dealing with, the kind of intelligence. Free will. What free will could you have? Because, yeah, I mean, people want to think, well, I, I, I can choose uh, what I want to eat. Well, yeah, yeah, we don't care about it. He's giving you that. You want to put that little latitude to, to choose that. But when it comes to your soul salvation, you don't have no choice. So does that mean... That you can't admonish folks and say, well, you know, you should do this or you should do that. No, you should. And that's what Paul did. He admonished them. He said, hey, you know, we're struggling. The flesh. You know, do this and, and try and do that. That's nothing wrong with that. But that's not saying that you have the power to, to choose it from within yourself. Whatever mystery is in you, is, that's what you're going to choose. And that's what you're going to do. And one's going to glory the Father. And the other's going to glorify himself. Did I got anything hanging? I don't think I did anything with that Yahshua one. I just can't, I can't overcome that one. But uh, choose you to stay. I tried, I think I, I tried to do, make you understand. You know, they're using that as a idea that, well, look, they chose to, they could choose, they could choose to serve Yahweh. You want to read 19? Sure. I want to put it in context. That's my point. I want to put it in context so they understand what's on that page. Because it's not they're choosing Yahweh or they're choosing other gods. It's either they're choosing one pagan god or another pagan god. Nike says they can't serve Yahweh. No, they can't because they don't have a heart in them. That's how it is. Or there'd be no, no need for him to come in and die and start a new covenant. If, if, go ahead. 
trying to... Joshua 24, 19. And Joshua said unto the people, You cannot serve Yahweh, for he is a holy owl. He is a jealous owl. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. Yeah. You know, uh, he's going to get the glory. Every knee is going to bow one way or another. We have to understand and realize just how blessed we are and how prevalent in, in, in the magnitude of what this class represents in this creation and what the school represents. You know, think about it. In September, when they had the September 11th thing, that devastated the whole world with the, with the, the Twin Towers. Yes. Nobody understood it. Why would someone do something like that? Yeah, we, we were blessed. We understood. Because a certain part of the school said, you don't need the law prophets no more. Throw them away. They're no good. Let's get above that. Look what happened. Why, would, why is there murders in schools? Why? Never think of, never ever, in, in, in our, my childhood, never dreamed of, of coming to school and worrying about getting killed, getting shot, getting murdered. Why? Because that's, what, that's what, what, what's going on in this school. You've got to understand, this is the only source of truth there is in the universe. This is it. Look at the tsunami. Again, what Scott was saying, you know, I was thinking of it today, I was watching it. You know, when you got people in this school who had all their hopes and all their 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 adoration towards a man who just passes away now all of a sudden all their all the things that they could see and hold are gone it's like that tsunami it just swept them away what are they going to do only by grace that didn't happen to us but it's happening to show us that we, look, look what's going on in this world look because what's going on in the world was going on in the school because that school was the only, one, only representation of the truth in this creation. And some tainted it. But it was purposed that way. We understand that. But these things are happening for us to understand and see and to be thankful of where we stand. We're no better, I'm no better than anyone else. I can't say anything about anyone else. But this gospel is beautiful. This gospel. This is a gospel of hope. This is a gospel of love and long suffering. This isn't a gospel of confusion. And this gospel doesn't separate people, it unites people. It's not going to separate us. There's no other camp. If you're, if you're under that name of Yahshua Messiah and He's in you, then you could sit down and we could talk about things. And if you're wrong, you could admit it. And say, yeah, you know, I was wrong about that. And move on. And just all, you, all your only hope and desire is is to be glorify your Father. Does that mean that because you know uh, we're under that name, we're not going to make mistakes? Sure, we're going to make mistakes. But the thing, the difference between the two mysteries is our conscience is going to be pricked. It's, it's going to bother us. It's oh man, we shouldn't. I shouldn't have died. No, I shouldn't have done that. And yet, the other mystery, not going to bother him at all. Not going to bother him in the least. He's in control of everything. And we need to understand and realize how blessed we are to stand before this gospel. And the responsibility to lay our lives down, our love down for our fellow man. It's not here. Here is okay. And especially now with YouTube but it's out in the world when you, in our families and we've all probably all been through our own families trying to but anyone else any other opportunity you have to represent this gospel that's that's what you're that's the purpose of this that's why he started a school was to create what ministers so by the preaching of the gospel by the hearing he controls your hearing he knows your thoughts he puts them in there before you think them. How can you think you are going to have any kind of effect or any kind of ability to save yourself? I'm going to choose this. Or I'm going to choose that. Because the only thing that's going to do, if you want to go that route, it's going to put you on a stage and say, look at how smart I was. Look at how good of a preacher I am. 
that I chose this and I did this and I did that. That's not what this is about. That's not what this is about. This is about a philoprogenitiveness, an unconditional love of your offspring. Or is it philo? Philo, philo. You know what I mean. You know, this gospel, it's just, it, it, you need divine help to see it, and you need divine help not to see it. Because I can say to you, well, it'll change you from life to death right from where you sit. And I can say that to another guy who walks in and don't know nothing about this, he look at me like I'm a nut. You know, we really? There's no difference between me and that guy, only by grace that we see it and understand it. It's by grace, it's by mercy. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. That's what this is about. This is about mercy. And look at what's going on in this creation. I mean, we're, we're right here. We are right here, ready to go on. We're going to be walking from one age on to the next. And all this flesh and all the baloney that goes with it is going to be left behind. The only thing we're going to be doing is glorifying our Father in eternity until this purpose ends. And then there's more purposes. There's been previous purposes and now there's, gonna, there's more purposes according to Dr. Kinley what I was told. Simplicity. Witnesses. Proof. Don't believe anybody. Don't honor any man. It's not about any man. It's about the penny. That's why my, my parable of the penny is so beautiful. I love that. Because no matter how little I know, and however much anyone that I, want, I, can, I perceive as knowledgeable knows, his penny is no more valuable than my penny. The whole thing is about getting the penny. It's about standing for the truth. So, I just hope someone, I tried to clear some of the confusion because I, I, I see it, you know, uh, it's, it's semantics. It's, it's people having ideas of a word, associating it with a word and, and not trying to be flexible about it. Saying, well, geez, choice, that means that comes from inner, from you, and you have a choice. Yeah, you do have a choice. However, whatever choice you choose has already been predestined that you did choose by the mystery that's in you. That's in context and that's by the purpose. It's got to be congruent with Yahweh's purpose. Free will. There's no, what free will could you have other than choosing your socks or, or what you want to eat? So that has nothing to do with the salvation of your soul. Same with choices. But when you really come down to it, when he knows every fair, every uh, thing that falls, what, do you, what kind of bird? Sparrow. Every sparrow that falls and every hair on your head, oh, you know, so you want to think that you have a choice about, well, yeah, I chose this or I chose that. Cool. That's, that's fine. But think about it because he puts the thoughts in your mind before you think them. That's how powerful, that's how omnipotent and omnipresent our Creator is. He leaves nothing to us. Because if He left it to us, what is it? It's all about the, it's, it's uh, the way in the man and it's under death. What is that? That's uh, Lamentations? Uh, Proverbs. Proverbs. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Proverbs. Proverbs. So, you know, the beauty of this is we can't, we can't alter it, we can't screw it up. It's exactly what's going on right now, at this moment, is what's purposed. All we can do is sit back and watch in amazement and, and just bask in the mercy and grace of our Creator. So I hope someone got something out of that. I give all honor and all praise unto Yahshua. With that, I'm going to sit down. Next speaker will be the Dean of the Syracuse Branch, Dr. Patrick Trevison.
Evening. Uh, can we go to Revelation 12th chapter and uh, just start reading about thir 13? Revelation 12 and 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman who brought forth the male child. So... The dragon sees that he's cast to the earth. So he starts to persecute the woman. Now the woman that he's, we got to find out what woman is being talked about here. Be patient with me, I'm a tiny bit dizzy, okay? So go to the first verse. Revelation 12 and 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. So there's a great wonder in heaven. Now this is part of his vision. John on the Isle of Patmos. And more importantly, his revelation. This is his revelation. The whole book of revelation here. The whole letter of revelation. This is his revelation. This is part of it. So he's seeing this wonder. He's seeing this. Okay, go ahead. There appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun. So he sees a woman clothed with the sun. Now we point this out all the time. There's a woman clothed in the sun here. As there in Jerusalem... On the day of Pentecost, there's a woman clothed in the sun. Now that's symbolic, and they're the physical manifestation. But they have the cloven tongues of fire over their head. So they make up that bride, or that woman, or they are the physical manifestation but they're the woman clothed in the sun. They're clothed in the spiritual sun. Do you understand? They're clothed in those tongues of fire, but they're clothed in the they're clothed in Yahshua. Because they're receiving the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. It's painted over here. Here's a woman. She's clothed in the sun. It's painted that way to show you how, see, we use the tabernacle. This woman is painted in the confines of the tabernacle. And the sun is over her head, or she's clothed in it. But this sun is showing you Pointing out Yahshua. She's clothed in Yahshua. This is you. This is you. And this is Adam and Abraham and Moses and all of them, all the way up, that received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. It's all of them. And the angelic, every, all of them, that constitute the woman clothed in the sun. That's what it's talking about here that John saw. That woman clothed in the sun. It's a remarkable thing. Okay? It's not talking about aliens here. It's not ta talking about anything weird. The woman is New Jerusalem. It's the assembly. You can, there, there's a lot of different ways you can phrase it. But that's what it is. Now go back down to the 13th verse, please, if you would. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth... So now the, you got to read the whole chapter, okay? Uh, 
But there's a war in heaven, and the devil gets cast into the earth because he loses the war. Because the lie basically is, has a war against the truth. And the truth is always going to defeat the lie. Doesn't seem like it a lot of times. A lot of times it does not seem like it. For instance, when they had Yahshua on this cross, the devil was saying, I finally got him. I got him. Thought he had him. It looked like the truth was finally being overcome by the lie. Not realizing, do you understand, that he was going to resurrect and that Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was going to be poured out in mankind multiply, be fruitful and multiply, you know, all over the world. And now there's, when we first came into class, we didn't have these camera things and, and filming classes and everything. We had to go from class to class and evangelize. But now you can just get on camera and people can watch it all over the world. It's unbelievable. And that's how people evangelize now. And <laughs> people in Japan watch, in Georgia, in the Caucasus, and <laughs> it's just unbelievable. All over, and I mean all over the world. Anybody that has the Holy Spirit in them, and it doesn't matter if that somebody just stuck way over there in the Caucasus or where they are, that make they make up that bride. They make up that bride. Now, start again in 13 here. I know I keep interrupting you. When the dragon saw that he was cast onto the earth, yes. he persecuted the woman who brought forth the male child. He, look, he's mad. He's mad. He's got an attitude. <laughs> and he persecutes the woman. So, here you have her painted here on the day of Pentecost, and here they are in the upper room. This and this are the same thing right here. Now, here's another picture of the woman clothed in the sun. And what do you got right next to her? Dragon. That's the dragon. That's the devil. And what's he doing? He's persecuting that woman clothed in the sun. He's persecuting that woman. Mm -hmm. That's what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And that's just a picture to to give you the idea of what we're talking about. But that's not what the devil looks like. He does not look like a dragon. He does not look the way Hollywood portrays him. He's actually a beautiful angelic creature. And he's actually very good at deception. That's his job. So go ahead and read that, please. And to the woman were given two Mm -hmm. The law and the prophets. The law and the prophets. Read. That she might fly into the wilderness. Into the wilderness. Into her place. Into her place. Where she is nourished for a time. And times. And, times and, half and half a time. Now that's time. Times and half a time. That's three and a half. Yahshua's ministry, ministry was three and a half years. Okay? So... He's teaching his disciples and the people or the, the bride, the future bride, for three and a half years, okay? And the devil is persecuting them all that time, right? Right to the point where he's got him up on that cross. 
right to the time and look Peter's denying him they get scared they scatter they're look but once that Holy Spirit is poured out in them there's a change they undergo they are different people totally different people there's a change that takes place there's a conversion that takes place within them totally different now they're not the same anymore not the same read please and the serpent cast out of his mouth water like a flood after no he the cast he cast see he cast water like a flood at the woman now people have been up here talking about these tsunamis tonight and this latest tsunami was wasn't as bad as the last one there in Indonesia killed a whole bunch of people okay not only in Indonesia but other places too and this just it was 20 feet high that water it just wiped out everything in its path I mean just wiped out of you've seen the pictures on the news houses the whole city of Palu gone everything was wiped out have you seen the pictures and the, they're still getting the bodies of the people okay they've only found a few survivors or I could say only a remnant survived you understand just as there was a remnant in this ark in that flood and that thing when that that was a first first there was an earthquake okay and then there was this tsunami and they look they had no warning none people were on the beach and stuff when that thing hit do you understand and he said I will come as a thief in the night look the point is the, the devil he cast this flood out of his mouth now the flood is bad doctrine that's what it is and these physical tsunamis in the earth plane are a manifestation of the bad doctrine that's being taught in the school let, let alone the world the junk that's being taught in the world we know that the devil's not going to get anybody with that but look at the people in the school he has got with the doctrine that he has taught the junk that has been taught right here in the school now that's a flood that has come out of the devil's mouth and it was just a tsunami that carried away people look at look at the empty chairs in here tonight just care how many people got carried away with that with the flood do you understand just and listen <laughs> they didn't have a choice either they didn't they didn't have it look oh I, I think I think I'll I'll get deceived you don't do that I, I just wanted to address that because it seemed to be on everybody's mind and I've been following it in the news quite a bit uh, keep reading there Deb just a little bit out of his mouth water like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood yes and the earth helped the woman now the earth helped the woman okay or 
You can go over there to uh, back in the law where the earth opened up and, and those that were against Moses were swallowed up. See, or those that stood up against the law and the prophets were swallowed up. Or you can look at it as you can use the creation to prove how this, this junk that's being taught in the school is just that, junk. Just that, junk. There are many, many witnesses in the creation you can go to to prove, to disprove many of the things that are being taught. Now, um, keep reading them. And the earth opened her mouth and swallow, swallowed up the flood yes. which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Because the devil cannot harm the bride because the bride is the body of Yahshua. And he's not going to harm the body of Yahshua. Mm -hmm. Seems like he is. Sometimes he really seems like he is, but he's not gonna. He's not gonna. It can't happen. No. Go ahead. And the dragon was very angry with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed mm -hmm. who kept the commandments of Elohim and have the testimony of Yahshua the Messiah. And so, I so we're in a war. We're in a war. The truth against the lie. Just like our government is in a war with many people. The truth against the lie. And there's a lot of lies being taught. And we're trying to teach the truth. Now, um, some of you were not here uh, when uh, I addressed Terry Welsh's eight-page synopsis that he had done there on choice accountability. and accountability and um, worked with it and showed how all the, the list that he had there of all those references from transcripts from the law and the prophets and all, all that was it was all fine but he, he was not he wasn't using it in the in the, in the confines of the purpose and uh, Ultimately, that you did not have a choice. And I was very careful to, to also say that uh, Terry was a, a very dear friend of mine, and I was not trying to badmouth him. I just uh, disagreed with what he had written in the thing there, you know? Well, this was an, on camera, and uh, he saw it, and he called me. And uh, we had a long discussion for about an hour and a half. And he, he told me that I was trying to explain to him. I said, Terry, I went here with Adam and Eve. I said, if Eve doesn't partake of that fruit and if she doesn't give it to Adam and he doesn't partake of it, they don't fall from heaven. 
they don't receive the, a condemned conscience. I said to him, now they didn't have a choice on whether they could partake of that fruit. Neither Adam nor Eve. He had to do it for the love of his bride. She had to do it and give it to him. They have to fall, they have to come, mankind has to come down. I said because it has to set up a situation where it's go going to, there's going to have to be a redeemer. So that mankind can be brought back up. Do you understand? He said, I agree with everything you're saying. He said, when you, except when you say, they don't have a choice. He said, I would say, and he went into a big explanation and said, <laughs> that they don't have control over the choice that they made. I said, well, Terry, I said, they're making a choice. It appears that they choose to partake of that fruit. But they don't really have a choice because mankind has to come down. I said, so ultimately they don't have a choice. He says, well, they don't have control over the choice that they make. I said, well, isn't that semantics? He says, in a way it is. He goes, but it explains it to people better. I said, well, if it makes you happy, I will say that to the class, to my class, you know, tell them, you know, that we agree as far as that goes, you know, it's true, they did not have control over the choice that they made. So I'm, I'm just telling you that because I told him that I would tell you that. And uh, I probably should have waited till a Saturday night when there was more people here, but you can share it with them or they can watch this or whatever, but uh, Since then, I've heard that um, uh, there are still some odd things being taught, and there are some very odd things being taught in uh, Springfield, and there are some problems in Springfield, and some of the folks there are upset. Some of the folks, a lot of the folks there are teaching the thing the way it's supposed to be taught. And there are, there's a handful of them there, there that are causing the problems, you know? And uh, it's too bad, but it has to be that way. It has to be that way, because the book said it would be that way. And it's in our scripture reading. Start reading in the scripture reading there. 2 Timothy 4 and 1. I charge thee therefore before Elohim and the Savior, Yahshua the Messiah, who shall judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be diligent in season and out of season. Now in season and out of season means... When it's convenient and when it's inconvenient. <coughs> Not just when it's convenient. Be always be ready to preach the word. Always be ready. 
In other words, not just when it's uh, comfortable to do so. It's comfortable to do so in front of your own class. It's not comfortable to do so in front of LA's class. You understand? That's out of season. <laughs> and, or, or in, all, in other words, there are friendly confines and there are unfriendly confines. Just like in the weather, you got warm fronts and you got what? Cold. cold fronts. And you all know what I mean. You've been in front of cold fronts, right? Mm -hmm. You've been in front of them. That's out of season. Go ahead. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. With all long suffering, exhort or urge. Urge. Paul was constantly urging them, right? Mm -hmm. Rebuking them. Reproving them or telling them, look, use the law and the prophets. Prove the things you're saying. Mm -hmm. Read. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Well, time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. That's that flood coming out of the devil's mouth. Read. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers. Don't look. They'll heap to themselves teachers. Mm -hmm. Now, for a long time, we got into this thing where it was their camp and our camp. That's not the case anymore. You've got to worry about people in our so-called camp and it it hurts me to have to say that but there's another place in there where it says uh, um, mark them that cause divisions uh, You're not talking about Ezekiel 9, are you? No, not Ezekiel. Mark those that cause divisions. I, I use this reference, but I think it might be Romans 16, 17. Romans 16, 17? Jeez, I thought it was first or second Peter. But you could be right. Romans? Yeah, 1670. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions. Mark those who cause divisions. Listen. And offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. Contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. Look, we learned predestination. And it's all through your book. Mark those who teach some contrary to it. I'm sorry. That's the way it is. And we can prove it with the law and the prophets. We, we don't have the charts up tonight. We can... There isn't anything. There isn't anything that isn't preordained. If he's declaring, like the speakers have said tonight, if he's declaring the end from the beginning, then that's what he's, it's all pre, he's preordained. It's preordained. It's done. It's, he's already preordained it. Read. In Romans here? Yeah. Mark that which caused division offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. For they are for they that are such serve not our master Yahshua Messiah, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. By good words and fair speeches, or in other words, <coughs> they know how to talk. 
don't know how to talk. Is that it, Peg? For, I, for your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. But yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. Good and simple. Simple. The simplicity that's in Yahshua the Messiah. I'll go back Deb, to the scripture. in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth. They turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Fables. What are fables? Untrue stories. Stories. Uh, like um, the Grimm brothers. Remember the Grimm brothers? They did all those fairy tales. The Aesop, Aesop's fables? The Grimm brothers? Like, um, oh God, I'll give you an example of. Uh, Cinderella was one. Yeah. Rapunzel. Rapunzel. Mm -hmm. um, the, Jack the Giant the, Killer. Yeah. Jack and the Beanstalk. Jack the Giant Killer was a fable. Oh, Jack and the Beanstalk. <laughs> no, I liked no, that no, one when no, I was a kid. Jack and the Beanstalk. Yeah. <laughs> oh. They were haunted by giants, and one day Jack killed seven flies. Oh. At one time, and he said, I got seven of them. And it blew into a story where he was Jack the Giant Killer because he thought he killed seven giants. Oh. <laughs> now, Jack and the Beanstalk may have come from that. Oh. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> now, uh, I'm thinking of uh, the kid and his sister that were in the forest and the witch. Hansel and Gretel. Hansel and Gretel. See, that's a, that's a fable. These things were all fables. They were told to kids to scare them so they would behave in the Middle Ages and stuff. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They were made up in to, to scare kids so they would be good. So they wouldn't be naughty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they're fables. They're not true. Now, people have turned their ears to fables. When somebody teaches you that, that salvation is in the name of Kenley, that's a fable. That's a fable, just like Hansel and Gretel. Do you understand? That's what I'm telling you. Go ahead and read, Deb. Watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Do the work of an evangelist, which we're trying to do. We're trying to do. The folks that run the camera and do the work with it and 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 turn the films in and do the batteries and do and do everything, run it, it, it film the classes. Doing the work of evangelists. It's all good. It's all good. Read, please. Make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Who is this speaking, Deb? Paul. This is Paul. He's ready to go where? To die. He's ready to die. He had to preach the gospel to Nero. So, <laughs> all right, you want to talk about scary. Paul wasn't scared. That's the thing. Well, I 
Nero was a, a homicidal maniac on a major scale. He just stood right there and preached the gospel to his face. Imagine that. Read. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. Fought a good fight. See? Fought a good fight. Fought a good fight. It said that the devil was there to make what? War. With the sons of that woman. So Paul was one of those birthed. And he fought a good fight against that devil. And we're all trying to fight a good fight too. In our way, everybody in his own individual way. Everybody's different. I right, thank you very much. Uh, I hope that somebody got something out of it. And uh, I had just planned to get up for five minutes or so, and <laughs> all praise be to Yahshua, the Messiah. Turn back with the moderator. everyone for being here this evening. We remind you we meet here Wednesdays at 7.30 and Saturdays at 7 o'clock. If you all please rise for the doxology. Mm -hmm. And now into Yahshua who alone is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise Yahshua our Savior belongs glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and for all time. So I'll say hallelujah. hallelujah.